number one, the waterfall. The worst thing that ever happened to me happened when I was only 13 years old, but that was back in the 1970s. I can only tell the story anonymously though, because even though it is really possible that all the people involved might be dead, it's not a chance I want to take. I was always a hiker. I liked being out in nature and the like. I actually got reminded of this story because I was watching a movie on Shudder. Although the situation was totally different, there was an aspect that made me think about it. I liked being alone in nature. I didn't mind being out all night and sleeping on the ground in my sleeping bag. If I could, I would spend several days out in nature all by myself. And in the area that I grew up in, there was definitely a lot of area to explore. This happened on a fall day, when I had a few days off school added to the weekend. I don't remember exactly why. I wasn't the biggest guy on school when it came down to it. Having a day off was always something to look forward to. I went hiking on this day and I was really energized. The first day went pretty good. I got a lot of distance covered and I got to see a lot of things that I had never seen before. I came across a nice creek and I followed it for a while. I came across a little waterfall, which I thought was really neat. So I decided to do a little skinny dipping in the creek, which was a bit weird for me. I didn't have a bathing suit and didn't want to get my clothes wet. I was always a bit nervous being naked, even when I was by myself, but I couldn't pass up the chance to go swimming in a waterfall. It was one of my best memories as I was about to turn into one of my worst memories ever. While I was swimming, I heard a shriek. It was a weird noise that I had never heard before, but the sound chilled me to the bone. It did not sound like any animal that I knew, but there were of course sounds that I had never heard before. I didn't know how a bobcat or a mountain lion sounded, but I had been told we had both of them in the area, and it immediately terrified me. Before I could do anything, however, I saw some movement further up on the hill. There were several people coming up over the top of the hill. I was frightened. I didn't know what was going on, but the terror I felt took over. Before anyone could see me, I quickly went behind the waterfall. There was a small cave behind it that was enough for me to barely hide. While I was standing there behind the water, I was able to make out what was happening. I was shivering because I had to stand still in the chilly water, but also out of complete terror of not knowing what was going on. Keep in mind that seeing what I could see through the waterfall wasn't exactly perfect. It was blurry but I was still able to make it out. There were at least four guys, but it seemed like a three-on-one encounter. The one guy was trying to get away from the other three. The three guys were pretty big and looked terrifying through the waterfall. I was breathing heavily, and I was worried about my clothes and my backpack that I had left on the other side of the creek. If the guys noticed it, they would know that I was there and I assumed that whatever they did to that guy, they would do it to me too, and I could tell that would not be a good thing. The guy stumbled, and he yelled as he did. I watched him struggle to get up, and right when he did, I heard a gun blast, and he completely fell down. You know in movies how you shoot someone, and they die right away? Yeah, that is not what happened here. The guy kept screaming and wailing and the worst sounds I'd ever heard in my entire life. I mean, it was scarier than any girl screaming in a horror movie. It was a wail of pain, agony, fear, and it sounded inhuman. Then, there was another gunshot. The wailing and shrieking stopped. I had my mouth covered, doing anything I could do not to throw up in the waterfall. I felt so sick to my stomach. I felt so scared. I literally felt my soul drop into my feet. 
I was confident that the second gunshot killed him. I watched in terror as two of the guys picked up the body. I kept shaking, fearing that they would spot my stuff. Fortunately, they never really got that close to the creek. It didn't take long before they were gone. Still cold and shivering, I found I couldn't bring myself to get out of the waterfall quickly enough. I didn't want to expose myself, even though time had passed, and I was sure that the guys were completely gone. But I couldn't force myself to even move, and probably stood in the cave for several hours before I finally got the nerve to get out from the cave, put my clothes on, and get out of there. I couldn't run, though. I was numb, and it was hard to get my legs to move, much less to run away. My mind was in a state of terror, and it didn't go away. I walked back towards my home in a total fog. I had been so far away from home, I couldn't do the walk in one evening. I had to make camp. I slept very poorly. It was the sleep that you feel you were still awake. It was terrible. When I did dream, it wasn't the type of dreams you want to hear about. When I got home the following day, I went to my dad and I told him what happened. I asked him to call the police, but he didn't. We lived out in the country, and this was in the 70s. My dad told me that there were people up in the hills that you didn't mess with. You didn't call the police on them, because even they don't do anything. He told me the best thing I could do was never tell anyone about it and just get on with my life. He told me that if we got the police involved and these people found out, we might end up like the guy who got killed. Now, of course, I did tell people, but most people didn't believe me. And it was just a few people over time. And nearly 50 years later, I'm telling you. Number 2. Hiking Story This story takes place in Arkansas's Hot Springs National Park. My wife and I are avid hikers and decided to take a weekend trip from Texas to Arkansas over Memorial Day weekend. For anyone that hasn't been to Hot Springs, it's a very small town that is centered around its bathhouses and national park. We got into town at about 1 p.m. and it was extremely crowded. I'll admit that we didn't do much research before committing to the trip, but that was okay. We figured we'd get up early the next morning and do everything that we weren't able to do today. We drove around a little bit, and after failing to find a parking spot, we decided on getting a quick hike in before checking into our hotel. Typically, we prefer the less traveled trails that offer a little more challenging terrain, rather than the high traffic areas, since we enjoy the solitude of being in nature and going at our own pace. We start our hike and decide to do a five mile loop that should allow us some good views and a quick stop at a natural spring to grab some water. Our hike was going great, came across a couple of other people along the way, but that was expected given the holiday and the time of day. About halfway through, we're coming down a steep incline that leads to a small clearing. When we see a woman standing there, looking into the surrounding forest. Initially, we didn't think anything of it, since we did spot some wildlife off the sides of the trail earlier in the hike. If anything, I thought we were probably going to run off whatever animal or bird that this lady was looking at. So we slowed our pace a bit, just in case she was taking a picture or something. As we were about 30 feet away, she backed up to the middle of the trail, and I was looking down at her phone. I assumed we would just say hello, pass her, and be on our way. The closer we got, the more detail we got in the situation. She was probably in her mid-30s, blonde, in a normal hiking gear. Nothing was unusual about her appearance, but I just had a feeling in my stomach that there was something off here. As we got within ten feet of her, she looked at us and said, Going down? I'll join you. Now my wife and I have been lifelong hikers, and in my opinion it's rare for something like this to happen. 
Nevertheless, I tried to be positive about the situation and believed this is just a fellow hiker looking for some company. The portion of the trail narrows and becomes a single track, but you kind of have to be in a single file line to go through. So I went first, my wife second, and this lady third. I'm listening to the conversation and occasionally turning back to check in and make sure everything is going smoothly. The conversation is pretty normal. Where we're from, first time in Arkansas, first time on the trail. Then I start to piece things together and start to get a little more cautious of what and how I answer some of these questions. The lady then asks where we're staying while in town. Since we booked everything last minute, we're honestly not sure of the full name. So we skirt the question saying, we're not really sure it's a little outside downtown. This doesn't seem to satisfy the lady. So she keeps probing and wondering where exactly we're staying, starting to get aggressive. At this point, we're coming to a fork in the trail that takes us down to one of the local parks that is pretty high traffic. I try to speed up without seeming suspicious and we eventually make it out without further issues. When we look back, we see the woman cutting back into the woods off the trail. I'm not sure what was going on there or what her intentions were, but you can never let your guard down while out hiking, no matter how rural or suburban the trail may be. Number three, the storm. It was late afternoon by the time I left Boulder. I'd had my eye on the closest flat iron, but had not gotten the inspiration to just go for it. Not until then. I'd hiked the surrounding area a few times, so I knew the terrain pretty well. I'd hiked along the valley, but never tackled the 45 degree face, or freestyled, to the peak. What made up the flat irons was a set of five massive sandstone rock formations that sprawled along the mountains to the south like giant dominoes, pointing up and out at random angles above the valley a few thousand feet below. From town, they resembled the plates on a dinosaur's back or the broken teeth on the mandible of a Neolithic giant from some mythological age. Picking my way through the thousands of wildflowers of almost every shape and color, I could just make out what looked like a thunderstorm coming out of the southeast. A thin strip of black started to amass there on the horizon. It was early summer, so late afternoon thunderstorms were not that unusual. Boulder is about 5,000 feet, so anyone who has lived in the mountains knows thunderstorms can come on hard and fast. They usually don't last all that long, especially in the summer months. Because I was 20, a seasoned hiker and well weathered, I just hitched from Las Cruces, New Mexico. I figured I was ready and willing for just about anything. By the time I reached the end of the trees and started to trace the edge, about 1,000 feet above the valley, the wind had picked up to 20 knots with gusts of 35, roughly 40 miles per hour. I stayed on the lee side on my way to the summit, hunkering in the trees until I reached their highest point at that sandstone edge and decided to follow that for a bit. Down in the town, street lights had begun to come on because of the encroaching dark. Just before I dropped over the edge and into what was rapidly becoming a violent thunderstorm, I mean, it was almost entirely black. The afternoon had turned into night, and visibility was down to zip. I turned to look, like Lot's wife, one last time at the besieged city, subsumed by the thick black clouds of the oncoming storm. Then, the lights went out. It had become so dark, I literally couldn't see my hand in front of my face. The wind gusting to fifty pelted me with hard cold rain 
and hail the size of marbles. It was all I could do just to hunker down and cover my face and head with my backpack and poncho. I must have fallen asleep or passed out because when I woke up, I found myself cross-legged in a cave with a rock overhang. It protected the entrance and me from most of the extreme wind and rain. What woke me was the searing sound of lightning, really close and the strong smell of ozone. The thunder was deafening, echoing everywhere, but it was the sound of the lightning itself, like a tonal crack and sizzle, and the smell of burning metal that intrigued me the most. At times I saw lightning bolts as wide as a house, jabbing the air above me, and the continuously echoing thunder just hanging there like one long blast, semi-permanently imprinted on my eyes and ears. The thunder sounded like a thousand megaton blast, echoing repeatedly off the surrounding cliff walls. It was overpowering and surreal. When I managed to pull myself away, long enough to look down at my hands and legs in the intermittent darkness, I was able to discern a light blue glow. Everything, including my backpack and poncho, was humming and cracking a faint blue light. Eventually, as my eyes adjusted, the flashes revealed a place I had never seen before. Keeping my eyes mostly closed for fear of flash blindness, I was just able to make out that I had somehow managed to crawl along a sheer rock ledge to where I was now. Where I was exactly, I didn't know. Through the constant flashes, I could only just make out what looked like a canyon wall directly across me some 150 or 200 feet away. Below me, a chasm dropped hundreds of feet. Above me, complete darkness. I couldn't see anything. It was like I was in a storm in a bottle. Inevitably, I settled down and just sat there, reverent and humbled yet ecstatic at the sheer power of the storm and being allowed a front row seat even with the lightning and thunder shaking sometimes threateningly my tiny cliffside box seat I don't know how long I sat there it must have been a while because when I tried to uncross my legs and stand up they were completely numb it took me some minutes before I was able to stand and when I did I noticed that everything had changed again the sky was now completely clear. The storm had gone and it was night. When I looked out and across from where I had been, the cliff wall was no longer there. I was back on the city side of the first flat iron, looking down at the city lights of Boulder spread out before me. Their familiarity was both comforting and dazzling. It was like waking up from a particularly vivid dream. When I looked up, it was not to total blackness, but to one of the most brightly lit night skies I had ever seen. There was a new moon, so a myriad of stars stood out, like a huge, high-definition map of the Milky Way galaxy. Somehow, I managed to notice a single point of light, moving from the same direction the storm had come. When it got to where it looked like it was directly over me, it stopped and just hung there. I had to crane my neck several times to believe what I was seeing. At first I thought it was a satellite, but shortly after it stopped it began to fade and shimmer like it was ascending, going straight up. Just before it faded out completely, it suddenly flared brighter than any of the surrounding stars and then shot out across the sky at an impossible speed, leaving a flash trail like a shooting star. Realizing I was too exhausted to go any further, I decided to camp there on the edge, still and forever, awestruck, sleeping between two worlds. I never did find it again, that place during the storm, when everyone I talked to didn't know where the canyon was or had ever seen or heard anything about a cave with an overhang or a canyon wall fitting my description. I just smile. A front row seat, indeed. Hey y'all, Kill the Orange Cat here. 
If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, please feel free to click the subscribe button and bell below, or click the icon of Ichigo the Cat that will appear at the end of this closing. Leave me a comment and share this video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have an original story you'd like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. But most importantly, don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.